and it's 9.30, so we're going to get started. Again, welcome everyone to the launch of the, the technical note on girls associated with armed forces or armed groups. I'm really happy to be here. My name is Bridget Kennedy Feaster. I am the, uh, a senior child protection specialist in UNICEF in New York, um, leading our children in armed conflict team. And I'm really pleased to be here to share this note uh, with you. We're about to get started. Again, uh, my, my very warm welcome to you and to um, all of our panelists. It's really my great pleasure to welcome you to this event. Um, and I wanted to tell you just briefly about the technical note on girls associated with armed forces or armed groups. First and foremost, this note is intended to contribute to practitioner knowledge on how to better program for girls in situations of armed conflict. This means programming to prevent recruitment or association with armed forces and armed groups, as well as to support girls' exit from armed groups and the reintegration process. This note was developed with a lot of consultation. It included uh, 43 key informant interviews representing 14 countries, a desk review of academic and non-academic literature, and a study of existing documentation about 37 different armed forces or armed groups. Today, we're really lucky to be joined by some of the greatest supporters of, of our work, and particularly um, supporters who really um, are interested in girls and supporting girls in particular. You'll hear opening remarks from some of them in, in, in a moment. We'll also have a presentation of the main findings and recommendations from the report from um, our principal and really strong art, uh, author, Sandra Magnon. This will be followed by some questions from me um, to start us off and hopefully some questions from you um, in the public. So that's the course of what we're gonna be doing today and I'd like to just get started. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Fantastic. So let me first, let us move right to our opening remarks. I'm going to introduce first Hani Mansurian. He's the co-coordinator of the Alliance for Child Protection for Humanitarian Action. During the past 20 years, Hani has worked across Africa, Middle East, and Asia in a variety of roles focusing on protection and well-being of children affected by crisis and conflict. He's got a doctorate in public health, a master's in international affairs, and an engineering degree. Over to you, Hani. Thank you very much, uh, Brigitte, and uh, delighted to be to be here speaking with all of you guys. Um, on behalf of the Alliance uh, for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, I want to welcome everyone to this la launch of the technical note on girls associated with armed forces and groups. It is an honor to be speaking among such a distinguished and diverse panel of experts, practitioners, advocates, and those who have first-hand experience of, of what association with armed forces and groups does um, to one. Um, I want to first express my excitement about the development of this technical note and, and finalization of it, not just because it's a huge contribution to the way that we program for children associated with armed forces and groups, but also because, the, because of its recognition of the fact that girls are also significantly impacted by the practice of recruitment of children. I will spend most of the five minutes that I have on discussing this issue of, of this rec the importance of this recognition and, and why we might have traditionally neglected um, girls associated with armed forces and groups. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to recognize the work that Plan International and UNICEF have done to, to bring this piece of work together and also recognize the large number of uh, individuals and agencies who brought their expertise and, and, and their valuable time and dedicated it to, uh, to this interagency product. Really well done to, to all of you. So as I mentioned, I want to discuss why our sector has historically been a bit negligent of the issue of girls associated with offices and groups. Of course, there are many reasons for this and a lot of it is discussed within the technical note itself, but I'll highlight three specific ones um, that I think would be good uh, food for thought as, as we, we discuss. Um, as it's mentioned in the technical note, data on associations of girls and uh, with armed forces and groups is often incomplete. It doesn't give us the picture, the real picture of, um, of the association. Numbers, as it's mentioned in the technical note, vary from 6% to 50%. 
um, and we see through different mechanisms, the MRM and, 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 and other sources that um, there are numbers cited 8%, 18%. So um, the fact that, I, um, that we, we do not have complete data on this issue um, has played a role historically in us not paying the, the attention that it deserves. Um, the second issue that I will that I'll mention um, that's also partly described in the note um, is the role that girls have commonly played within armed forces and groups, and it has not always been codified um, in in either programmatic um, um, frameworks or legal frameworks as uh, as as being part of the association with with armed forces and groups. Um, so the the many roles that has been has been mentioned in the, in in the note in the technical note, apart from combatants, for, for example, um, carriers or um, wives or um, sexual partners, these have not always been associated with uh, with what commonly is understood as part of part of children associated. Um, we used to, as many of you know, that we used to actually use the term child soldiers and child combatants instead of children associated. And I think the shift in the terminology was actually a step forward in recognizing that there's much more beyond uh, just being um, an actual combatant. Um, and if a child is not a combatant, who he or she is not always taken as seriously um, as, as, as others. Interestingly, even among the ranks of, of um, uh, children formerly associated, they don't always consider those that are that were not combatants in the same at the same level. Um, and a lot of DDR programs um, actually included gun ownership and ability to use it uh, as a requirement for receiving services, um, DDR services and reintegration services. So, um, so this is another reason that we have historically not included, not been as good in including girls. Um, the third issue is, is uh, in a way, a, a cultural issue that I want to highlight, and that's um, the, the issue of reintegration of, children, of girls versus boys. They both are extremely complicated um, uh, issues um, and, and pro programmatically and, uh, and also culturally, but they're very different from each other. And I, and I feel that this has uh, the fact that girls, um, the reintegration process for girls um, has, a, has a significantly different um, implications, has played a significant role in, in some of this negligence that, that has taken place. At the end, I want to leave you all with a challenge. And that challenge is, I want us all to reflect on how do we ensure that from now on, hopefully using this technical note that, that has, has taken that very first, very big step, um, how do we ensure that we always, when we, when we use the term CAFAC, children associated with armed forces, children, um, people naturally think of girls and boys rather than what has been often the, the case that children associated has given the connotation of re, us talking about boys. While of course, while particular needs of boys and girls um, are, are different from each other, but the issue remains the same. The violation of rights, rights of children remains the same and many root causes and risk factors that lead to association of children with armed forces and group, groups remain the same. I leave you with a hope for a day that neither girls nor boys have to be subjected to the brutal realities of, of children associated with armed forces and, and, and groups. And I wish you all a very uh, productive webinar. Over to you, Bridget. Thank you so much um, uh, for that, Hani, and for really that call for us um, and that hope for us. We're very lucky now to have a video from Miss Virginia Gamba. She was unable to attend today, uh, but I just like, she's, she's a huge supporter of um, work around reintegration. She's the special representative of the Secretary General on Children in Armed Conflict. She brings more than 30 years experience and professional leadership on issues related, relative to disarmament, peace and human security in the UN, Africa and in her home country. And we're really pleased that she was able to share some of her thoughts. Excellent. This is ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to share a video message today for the launch of the technical note 
on girls associated with armed forces and armed groups, which is a topic very dear to me. I believe this technical note is a much needed effort and it comes at a very timely moment. I congratulate UNICEF and Plan International for the work undertaken. The note highlights the vulnerability of girls who, like boys, are involved in a variety of roles when associated with parties to conflict, but who are often overlooked in the final analysis. Girls cover both combat roles as well as supporting roles and are often sexually exploited. Unlike boys, many more girls have been recruited and associated because of abduction or forced transfer to this function. In fact, in many of the situations of armed conflict that my office covers, 40% of children recruited and used are girls. Tragically, even when conflict ends or there is a negotiated release and separation of children from war in camps, girls associated are often not even counted or acknowledged as part of this group of children. They are often separated from the camps without the protection of reintegration programs and therefore are not only invisible but also remain unprotected. For this reason, the acknowledgement of the specific vulnerabilities of girls is essential, not just to assist in developing prevention plans that better reflect girls, but also to be to, to better tailor reintegration and rehabilitation programs for survivor girls and for those released from armed conflict. The reintegration of girls associated with parties to conflict must be a priority, both from a programmatic and donor perspective. We must not forget that conducted a gender-focused analysis is one of the key requirements to ensure that reintegration programs do not put girls at further risks. Important aspects to consider in this regard include, among others, the conditions of return, understanding what was the life of these girls during their association with the relevant party to conflict, whether they had children as a result of the sexual exploitation they underwent during their association, and the stigma that they may face upon return to their communities. My office strongly believes that the political, cultural, and socioeconomic aspects of reintegration of girls are crucial elements to consider for long-term and sustainable reintegration, and programs should be designed based on a thorough analysis and available data on their realities and their needs. Referring now to sexual violence and abuse of girls as one of the six CAC grave violations, this is one of the most difficult violations to monitor and verify, which although it affects both girls and boys, overwhelmingly shows that girls are the principal victims. Very often, survivors of sexual violence are girls associated with parties to conflict, and equally often they have been victim of other violations, such as abduction and recruitment and use. Because girls remain the principal victims to conflict-related violence, I strongly believe in the importance of involving girls formerly associated with armed forces and groups in designing reintegration programs, as they are the ones who would be best placed to advise on what can and cannot work based on their direct experience. Their involvement in this process can help prevent other girls to face challenges caused by inadequate reintegration and recovery programs, as well as to best advice on measures to reinsert them to their own communities. I will stop here as my time is limited, but I would encourage all of you to read thoroughly this technical note and in particular its lessons learned and recommendations, as they can be an eye-opener, especially for donors who have the possibility to make a change for these girls by prioritizing a gender-sensitive approach in the allocation of funding. I would like to conclude by sharing my deepest appreciation and thanks to the experts involved in drafting this technical note, and to UNICEF and Plan International for impeccably leading this process. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. So now I'm going to turn. I have uh, to um, Genevieve Boutin. She is a uh, deputy director for our program division in UNICEF. 
um, before assuming that role, she served uh, uh, for you in UNICEF in several roles, including special re representative for the state of Palestine, chief of humanitarian affairs for Middle East and North Africa, serious, Syria crisis coordinator, and also the chief of our humanitarian policy section. It's really my great pleasure for us to hear from her um, today. Over to you, Genevieve. Thank you, Bridget, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Um, greetings to our distinguished guests, our government partners, to the colleagues from Plan International and Alliance, colleagues, as well as all the child protection experts who've joined us from all over the world. Um, I'm honored today to speak with you as we launch this technical note on girls associated with armed forces and armed groups. And these short remarks, I'm gonna focus on highlighting some of the many ways in which we can and must learn from the experience and insights of girls affected by armed conflicts and from our colleagues who've been supporting them at the field level. We need to continue to work together to better understand the nature and reasons for recruitment and use of girls by armed forces and groups. The experiences that girls have during their period of association the impact of this experience on them and what they need, as well as what they don't need from us as they exit armed forces or groups. As we mark the 20th anniversary of the ratification of the optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child on the involvement of children in armed conflict, we certainly can celebrate that 180 countries are either a state party or a signatory to the convention. However, we're keenly aware that girls still remain in the ranks of armed forces and groups all over the world. And these girls are too often uncounted, unseen, unheard, and therefore they are unserved or underserved. Too often we overlook the risks, the unique and particular risks that they face, the needs they have, and we fail to give them the influence they should have over their own destinies. This new technical note that we're launching today is a key step in the process of revealing hidden issues for our programming. I can speak for UNICEF, but I know all of our partners feel the same, that we will use this note to enhance our programming in this area. As for UNICEF, we have programming in support of girls associated with armed forces and armed groups in more than 20 countries at the moment. But more importantly, I, I think, we really need to reflect on not only programming for girls, but programming with girls themselves, to give them the agency and to listen to their voices supporting them in deciding for themselves what is right for their future. As you'll read in the note and you'll hear from our panelists today, you will see that girls agency, collective and individual agency to participate in, influence, and change their own destinies and the destinies of their communities an essential component of what we all must strive to achieve. It's essential for effective prevention, for exit and for reintegration. And you'll read that Girls who have little to no agency sometimes join armed forces or armed groups to gain power in a situation over which they have little control. Girls sometimes stay in armed forces or groups once they are there because they are given a role or an authority within the group that they cannot find outside. Or girls may rejoin an armed force or an armed group because they are treated as less valuable after they have exited the armed group. So we have a lot to learn and a lot to do together. In closing, I'd like to thank our donor partners, USAID, CEDA, and the Kingdom of Belgium for their support on preparing this note and more generally for their support to the Children in Armed Conflict Agenda and Plan International for their invaluable partnership and for always maintaining a focus on girls. And like Hani, I will leave you with a hope. My hope is that our teams will make very good use of this new important tool to support strong and resilient girls. Thank you. Thank you, Genevieve, for those words. Really excellent. Uh, so now I'm going to turn to one of our one of our donor partners, um, Elizabeth Drevlau. She is the acting team lead and humanitarian protection advisor with USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian As uh, Assistance Protection Team. She's worked in the protection space for 12 years and before that as a social worker within child welfare systems. She specialized in child protection and mental health and psychosocial support and has worked primarily in Africa with NGOs and UNICEF uh, in, in that capacity as chief of child protection before she came to BHA last year. 
really happy to, to hear from the donor perspective. Over to you, Beth. Thanks so much, Bridget. And thank you to all who've spoken already. Greetings to all. It is such an honor to be joining this distinguished panel and this fantastic group that we have online. Today, this launch marks another achievement in the journey to establishing more targeted and effective programming for children associated with armed groups, armed forces and armed groups. This note is not only a win for CAFAG and those supporting them, but it is a win for girls and women at large, as the emphasis is on understanding girls' specific experiences and developing a gender-sensitive response. Humanitarian protection, and in particular, the care and protection of children is a long-standing priority of USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, or BHA, as we're known for. We seek to ensure this protection through a variety of efforts. Um, and in the past years, on average, we've given around 60 million a year um, to children, I'll say in FY 2019, across crises in 27 countries. As to this particular effort, we recognize that children's needs vary greatly depending on gender, age, developmental status, life experiences, support systems, etc. And in our response, we must pay special attention to the heightened vulnerabilities and unique capacities of girls and adolescent girls particularly. And we must continue to tailor programming to meet their individual needs and build on their strengths and capabilities. Globally, we take note of the many issues that affect girls associated with armed forces and armed groups, and we highlight the great need to ensure that programming is gender aware and takes into account the voices of the girls themselves. While we have the Paris principles and other guidance documents, including now this note, there is still much to be done to ensure that programming is practical, contextualized, and inclusive to meet the needs of girls associated. We're very hopeful this note being launched today will be used to support this effort to further develop these um, various programs for girls and we encourage evidence-based efforts in the process. We wanna say a massive thank you to UNICEF and to Plan International for their invaluable work on this note. We applaud CEDA for their joint effort in supporting this and we thank the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action always for their support on this and other key pieces of work. We also recognize the many contributions from so many others in this field of work, including many of you on the call. And we look forward to strengthened collaboration globally for girls impacted by armed conflict, notably those associated with armed actors in the years ahead. Back to you, Bridget, thank you. Many thanks, Beth, really, really helpful. So those are our opening remarks. They set the stage, I think, for us. Uh, uh, as we move now into our panel discussion, I really thank all of those those um, of you who just gave remarks. It's really helpful to, to frame what we're looking at and what we're trying to achieve. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Sandra. Sandra is, as I said, Sandra Monyol is an advisor for on children associated with armed forces and armed groups working with Plan International. She has led the research and the development of the technical note on girls that we're launching today. She co-leads as well the Task Force on Children Associated with Armed Forces and Armed Groups of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action along with UNICEF. And we're so pleased that she's able to present today some of the key issues and findings. I wanted to make sure that everybody knows that we, we've posted links to the document. It is live, it is downloadable. We will be getting it translated as well into multiple languages. And we will also have webinars on it, but to, to get into more technical detail. But I'd like to now turn it over to Sandra to, to give us this overview of the note itself. And then we will open up for questions to all three panelists. So over to you, Sandra. All right. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to see so many people uh, joining us today for the launch of this technical note. So the purpose of this technical note is to provide recommendations to field practitioners and donors to program effectively for girls associated with armed forces and armed groups. This is a quick summary and I encourage you to have a look at, a, at the technical note for more detailed information. So first I'd like to share some global recommendations that cut across the prevention, the release and the reintegration stage. 
So the first recommendation is to conduct a context and gender analysis so that field practitioners have a full understanding of the risk factors that can lead to girls recruitment, as well as the protective factors that can prevent recruitment. They can also understand the challenges that, fit, that girls face in leaving armed forces and armed groups, in accessing services, and the stigma they may experience upon their return. And this is to avoid uh, doing harm. Then um, I encourage field practitioners to acknowledge a girl's agency and the decisions that they may have taken to join armed forces and armed groups based on the situation they face at the time. This is important to empower girls to be actor of their reintegration and not just passive victims. Then um, the involvement of girls in the project design and the implementation is, is important. They know what they need. Um, they know how to prevent their recruitment, how to facilitate their release, as well as their reintegration. So it's important to engage them for our older process. And the last uh, global recommendation is to work with what I call community influencers. These are allies in the community who have the power to shift social norms. Um, these people can make recruitment unacceptable, for example, or they can improve community acceptance, so help girls to relieve their, their guilt. So in, involving them at all the stages um, will support field practitioners in effective programs. So now let's move to uh, the prevention. So the prevention uh, is addressed for two approaches. The first one is a multi-level approach. So a multi-level approach is uh, focusing on how to address the risk factors as well as strengthening the protective factors. And this is at all levels of the socio-ecological framework. So if you only address one level, uh, for example, the family level, it's unlikely that this will be enough to effectively prevent recruitment. So in the technical note, you will find some suggestions of interventions at all levels. So for example, uh, girls empowerment programs can um, help girls to make better decisions. Um, there are also examples of gender transformative programs that aim to shift harmful social norms and these can contribute to prevent recruitment. The second uh, approach is a multi-sector approach. So here the child protection sector alone um, will unlikely be able to prevent recruitment. It should be a shared responsibility across all relevant sectors. So child protection actors can, uh, for example, coordinate and promote uh, missing services in areas where we know there is active recruitment. So for instance, if the lack of quality education is identified as a risk factor to recruitment, then the education sector should be engaged. Now let's move to the release. Um, before I move to recommendations, there are some key considerations that I would like to highlight. The first one is that the identification of girls is extremely challenging. All field practitioners um, have highlighted this as a challenge. Um, the second point is that we may cause harm in actively identifying girls. We can expose them to further risk in labeling them as associated with armed forces and armed groups. And um, the last point that is coming from, from the research is that formal DDR release programs are often less successful to release girls and boys. And this is because of the military nature of the DDR processes. So now, so here are some few recommendations um, for the release programs. The first thing is to always assume that armed forces and armed groups have recruited girls to not miss an opportunity to identify them. We have some interesting experience from South Sudan, for example, where before 2018, only 1% of the CAFAG identified were girls. After 2018, the DDR actors have shifted their approach and were able to identify up to 38% uh, percent of girls. Uh, the second point is that release programs should always uh, include both formal and informal modes of release 
to maximize the opportunities to identify girls. We know that girls tend to prefer informal modes of release um, when they leave uh, armed forces and armed groups by themselves and go back to their community directly. And this is so that we can give them access to both options. Now let's look more specifically at formal release. So the first point is um, to identify and train military child protection focal points in military units and DDR teams. There is some anecdotal evidence from few contexts that military personnel have more credibility to negotiate a release with armed group leaders, for example, than civilians. Armed group leaders like feel more respected when they interact with military personnel, and they're therefore more open to negotiations to release girls and boys. In some contexts, combatants and commanders tend to hide girls, pretending they are their daughters or their wife. And uh, in that situation, providing services directly to girls, um, such as a vaccination for their children, nutrition, or any other health services, may help to build trust with the girls and then give us an opportunity to explain them their rights and their options, uh, whether they want to stay in the armed group or not. The last point for the formal release is that in some contexts, we can uh, and should include some male and female community members who may have more access to armed groups than, for example, the UN or, or the government actors. And particularly, the, uh, this is particularly true when the armed groups are community self-defense armed groups. So in this uh, context, it can be really interesting to involve the community members along other uh, DDR actors. So the informal release. Here, the first point is to establish or strengthen community level mechanism to safely identify girls and who have informally exited armed forces and armed groups and refer them to child protection actors. Uh, I'd like here to, um, to mention one example from Somalia, uh, which I found really interesting, where a traditional women and girl solidarity network helped fellow practitioners to identify girls who were associated. So these girls, these were girls who were um, um, self uh, exited, informally exited armed forces and armed groups and were identified for that, that process. The second point is the provision of non-targeted services. We know that girls will more likely access services if they don't have to disclose their association. So service providers can provide services for um, multiple vulnerabilities um, and then later on identify girls and refer them. This can contribute also to the decrease of sometimes resentment that the population may have against girls who can access services that other children cannot. It can also reduce the incentive of children to join armed forces and armed groups to access those services. And here the last point is uh, in some contexts where girls have the opportunity to leave the armed groups, um, disseminating messages that they will be welcome back home um, can be effective. There are a few contexts where when girls have this opportunity to leave, they basically fear uh, family and community rejection. So knowing they will be welcome uh, may encourage them to leave those armed groups. So now I'd like to move to the reintegration stage. So there are some uh, key consideration. There are many, but I, I selected a few for you today. Uh, the first one is the, the level of stigma for girls is more severe it lasts longer and is more difficult to decrease than for boys. The, the study that, that we conducted also highlighted that the presence of children and the experiences of uh, sexual abuse will likely increase the, the level of stigma. And uh, in some other contexts, girls who had positions of power, who had equal treatment between men and women, may find it more difficult to return to gender stereotype roles to uh, patriarchal societies. So these experiences will have an impact on the reintegration process of these girls. And as field practitioners, we need to adapt the support that we provide to their needs. So now I'd like to look at some of the outcomes that we seek for the reintegration process. 
Um, the first one is here, the safety and care. So some girls may need alternative care, not all of them. And when they need alternative care, one recommendation is to encourage field practitioners to prioritize foster care or kinship care. There is anecdotal evidence from few countries that shows that girls who go through foster care reintegrate more successfully than girls who go through interim care centers. Um, there are also uh, some fellow practitioners who have found that placing two girls in one foster family increases the chances of successful reintegration. So girls form a support network that contributes to build their resilience. In terms of legal support, I like to highlight here um, civil documentations and how this can enhance girls' sense of safety and their ability to move freely in some context. So these can include, among others, um, an exit certificate, for example, or a birth certificate. So now let's look at social reintegration, uh, which is really key in the reintegration process. The, um, we know that um, family, the family plays an essential role in the success of the reintegration process. There are numerous research that show the positive impact of welcoming families on their psychosocial well-being and also on their reintegration um, at the community level. So families as well as partner uh, should be supported before and during the reintegration process so they can provide a supportive environment um, to the girls. We also found uh, a formal and non-formal education that is not targeting uh, only girls who were associated can help them to retrieve what they call their lost value due to their association. So in some contexts, girls um, felt like they've lost their value to the sexual abuse, whether it's real or, or perceived. And so in that case, having um, a, a diploma can help them to rebuild their self-worth. A further recommendation is to involve the community influencers and, and girls to shift social norms related to stigma and to develop innovative awareness raising campaign. There are a few examples in a technical note, things like drama plays or radio talk shows um, that seem to have had some positive impact. In Nigeria, uh, some organizations have used some radio episodes where CAFA characters face rejection from the community. And these supports seem to have contributed to gradually raise empathy uh, within community members and reduce stigma. So now in terms of physical and mental health, the first thing is to conduct a medical assessment um, that then should include things like a screening of impairments, uh, pathologies that are a result of sexual abuse, wounds, um, drug and alcohol addictions uh, as well. We also um, heard from multiple fellow practitioners that the discretion and confidentiality is key, particularly for unmarried girls when they seek help uh, for sexual and reproductive health, for example. In terms of mental health, we found that the, the power of collective approaches has been highlighted in multiple studies. So encouraging girls to meet other girls who have been associated has shown positive impact on their resilience. There are also group reintegration approach that have demonstrated positive outcomes on their reintegration in some context. The cleansing and welcome ceremonies and that are not harmful for the girls, I want to emphasize, can be successful in promoting their reintegration and reducing psychosocial distress. There is some interesting research showing positive impact in South Sudan, in Mozambique, or in Nepal. The financial self-sufficiency. And here I like to highlight self-sufficiency. This is really the outcome that we seek for uh, livelihood uh, interventions. And it's not always the case. So um, here we encourage field practitioners to conduct market assessment at the community level, but also to assess individual situations. Some girls may have access to family business networks that could be leveraged. 
Then, um, so business, uh, basic business skills and financial uh, literacy should be provided, including how to separate family affairs and business and how to resist family partners and friends pressure. Um, there are also recommendations to um, provide networking, access to microcredit and mentorship from women who have uh, been successful in, the, in a particular field of work um, to contribute to the sustainability of girls' business. And here the last point is to avoid those one-size-fits-all program where girls have the choice between a few specific uh, gender, very gender specific trades. Um, really we encourage program um, to be more tailored to the needs of individual girls. So here I'd like to highlight some um, specific needs that, that girls may have. The first one is for girls with children born of sexual violence. We found that these girls often need more support. They may need help with the registration of their children's birth. In some contexts, they may be at risk of harm in their community and uh, need to be relocated to safer places, um, like urban centers, for example, where they may find greater anonymity. Economic support is key, so they can provide for their child and not be a burden to their family. They also need childcare to have equal access to services as other girls who don't have children. So when you have programs for girls, like access to childcare is really key for girls with children. And some girls may face challenges to build a positive relationship with their child. And this is because of the circumstances of the conception of their, of their children. So some of them may need support to build attachment to their child and be encouraged to use positive parenting practices. So this can be done through group counseling or parenting skills for programs. The last point I'd like to highlight is girls with disabilities. I have to admit that it was a bit challenging to find information for, uh, for these girls. Um, it seems that impairments of girls who have been associated with armed forces and armed groups are not well documented. And so one of the recommendation is to is a systematic use of the Washington group set of questions to identify those impairments uh, during medical screening. Then these girls will need support for social inclusion and access to services. Um, and their parents will also need to be supported to provide a caring home environment. All right, this is the end of, of this presentation. I'd like to also mention, so for now, the, the technical note is available in English. I think the, the link is, um, has been added in the chat. And um, the, the French, the Spanish, as well as the Arabic translation will be available towards the end of December. Thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for all of that detail um, for us and leading us through some of the key recommendations. Um, very much appreciated. So I'd like to open it up to questions. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we have the Q&A function. I think we have one question just uh, uh, looking for some links, Sandra, around um, studies on mental health and psychosocial support. Um, but I, I encourage uh, those of you who are, have been listening in, to, if you have any specific questions, you can put, put them in, in English, in Spanish, in French, uh, and we will be able to convey them to our speakers. Okay, I'm going to ask a question for, um, for Sandra. Oh, I have, we have a question um, from the floor, Sandra. Um, around economic reintegration. You talked about the term self-sufficiency, kind of re replaced the term uh, economic reintegration with the term self-sufficiency. And the comment is around whether that's ambitious enough. How can uh, we take other lessons learned on long-term vocational training, career development, and other um, those aspects of economic reintegration? Um, what, it, what is it, maybe you can unpack a little bit what you were talking about when you talked about self-sufficiency. I would say that for what I've seen and then the, the assessment report that I've read from uh, multiple contexts is that we're not there yet and there is still a lot to do. Um, so I see quite a lot of livelihood interventions 
that are not leading to economic uh, empowerment or self-sufficiency. What these girls are telling us in uh, all the research is that they want to be uh, self-sufficient. They want to provide for their family. They don't want to be a burden to their, um, to their family. And that will have also an impact on their social reintegration. The community is watching them to see if they can be self-sufficient, if they can uh, provide for themselves. And um, we have to admit that what has been done so far, and I speak, of course, in general terms, so I'm sure there are places where these programs have been successful, but globally, we still have a long way to go to, um, to provide self-sufficiency. Most of those programs uh, are quite expensive, and they are... Um, it seems that they have more impact on uh, psychosocial um, outcomes than on economic outcomes. So not to say that all of it is, um, should, be, um, should be removed or is wrong. It has some positive impact, but not enough on the economic and self-sufficiency. And so there are some suggestions in the technical note on how to um, help these girls who need immediate uh, support like it's not they don't have time to do a very long uh, career development and uh, they need uh, they need money now so there are some options where we can have progressive training so they can do a short training now start with a particular economic activity and then have like on the job training or a repetitive training for example later on to help them improve their skills and then um, improve in their, in their business, for example. So um, I agree with you, it's not ambitious enough, but, but what I've, I've seen and read is that there's still, we're not there yet. There's still a long way to go. Thanks, Sandra, for that. And I encourage others to go ahead and put additional questions or comments that you have in the chat. So I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask another question um, of, of Sandra. Um, I think it, the, in the SRSG statements and as well other of the comments donors were mentioned. And I was wondering if, if in the course of your conversations with individuals or entities that you had an opportunity to um, maybe have developed some specific recommendations for donor, donor countries about what could be helpful, specifically focusing on girls. Yeah, so there are a few things. Um, I think specifically focusing on girls is to, um, I would say, is to really encourage donors that to fund programs that are based on a gender analysis. Because we can do so much harm in uh, programming for girls, like in actively identifying them and maybe exposing them to fever risk. So this needs to be well documented so that we, um, we, we can prevent uh, further harm. The next thing is to also encourage uh, field practitioners to program effectively um, for girls from the get-go. Sometimes we hear, but there are no girls, there are only boys. But I think the examples from South Sudan is, is really eloquent. Like if you don't program for girls, you will not identify them. And, and that's why like coupled with the gender analysis, then you can adapt your program and then you may find more girls. Um, I think for donors also um, the issue of non-targeted services. Um, I know that this can be challenging as donors want to fund specific programs targeting girls who have been associated but if you, uh, you, you make it as a requirement to access services as a criteria that you may miss on a lot of girls. And uh, whereas if you allow the, the, the service providers to provide services for multiple vulnerabilities, it will reduce the stigma on girls. You will still find them. And then maybe later on when they feel more, uh, when you build trust, they may disclose their association and then you can um, report on them. But so really um, being more flexible on the, the criteria for, for service provision. And the last point that is more for um, both boys and girls on CAFAG in general, and that's something that almost all fellow practitioners have shared with me during uh, the key informing interviews is the funding is really too short. So funding uh, for six months 
with CAFAG is, is unlikely to be effective. Those processes take a lot of time. Reintegration takes uh, one year, two years, uh, even three years in some contexts. So allowing enough time, uh, longer time frame for funding uh, will help for practitioners to be more effective to uh, fully reintegrate uh, CAFAG here, it's like for both boys and, and girls. Um, I have a, a question um, in Spanish from Eliana. Um, I'm wondering, Sylvia, if you can um, translate that question for us. Sure. Um, la, should I translate myself? Yeah. Either way, it's up to you. You can. Okay. Uh, yeah. So there's a question from our colleague um, from Save the Children in Mexico, where there's narco traffic and organized crime. Uh, so the question is like, what are the strategies uh, for documentation in the field uh, used by the experts, by the um, professionals to obtain the information and to um, conduct like an assessment and um, analysis without putting in risk, like putting uh, the integrity of the staff at risk? Okay, so this is somehow um, asking about um, doing some analysis and preparatory analysis for preparation of programming. Yeah, um, and related to the security. Yeah, yeah. and uh, in, this is in the context of um, criminal and organized crime, which is often similar to an armed conflict situation. Um, Sandra, do you have any quick points on that? Mm. Yes, well, that is... Uh... I haven't received that much information on this. I think it's really, um, it's almost a, a personal sense of safety. Some people are ready to um, take more risk because they know the community well. So what we've seen is that sometimes community members in those community, they know exactly what they can do and what they cannot do to ensure their safety. And they are more efficient than people from outside the community who may make mistakes because they don't have the sense of the nuances. Uh, so for example, in, in Colombia, I've heard of teachers who are very useful in identifying girls who are still going to school, but uh, why being um, enrolled in those uh, armed groups. And so they, they're able to identify the signs and then to discuss with these girls gradually to, to know like, you know, there are maybe other options and so on. Um, same with like women uh, associations in those communities were very strong and have a lot of power that NGOs or um, outsiders will never have. And those women were able to exfiltrate girls who were at risk of recruitment. Um, so I would say work more with the community members than uh, trying to intervene as outsiders. That's um, what I've heard, at least from the from the full practitioners from these uh, these environments, this context. And maybe I can just add one other thing. I mean, this is this is one of the key questions that we have is in situations of armed conflict, uh, they often occur in places where there are some systems in place. As Sandra was mentioning, some of those are community-based systems. Some of those can be more formal systems. This is one of the reasons why I think the recommendation around non-targeted assistance is there. So essentially, one of the ways to identify girls is through existing programming or existing interventions or existing systems so that you can develop confidential networks, trained personnel working on case management for child protection um, or for gender-based violence. And through those existing mechanisms, without trying to expose um, and target openly um, and identifying girls and, and boys too, for that matter, um, be able to have that informal um, re outreach and, and documentation um, for these children. So some of it is about looking at what entry points you may already have in the communities in question. Um, so hopefully that gave you some food for thought. Uh, I'd like to, um, we have a question um, from Myanmar, um, Sandra, um, 
one question, I guess it's, it's around um, returning or reintegrate, reintegrating girls into a location where the armed group may still be either operating or be their, their kind of controlled territory uh, and the opposite, bringing them out of the territory and supporting them in government controlled areas. Um, what options to intervene uh, could be undertaken during separation um, when um, within her own community is not a good option? So you have these, these two sets of risks. These are very complex um, context. I would say the first thing is to look at the safety of the girls and to discuss that with, uh, with her, with them. Um, and to know how they feel. Do they feel comfortable going back to this community or going out of that community? There are some girls, they, they just, uh, you know, say it very, um, very clearly that um, they don't want to go back to their community. They know they will be at risk, um, them and sometimes their children. And so they want to be relocated um, outside. There are other communities where they feel that they they don't have uh, the choice. Maybe their family is uh, enrolled also in the, um, the armed forces and armed groups. This is something that has been um, highlighted quite a few times. And so this idea of the, the exit as being a, a one-off event, you're within the group or you're out, is actually not that straightforward. We see more uh, kind of back and forth movement. and um, in the technical notes, you will see there is actually different stages. So we'll look at the uh, um, disengagement um, and then the, the, the full, ex so there is a first stage, which is when the children stop actively uh, working with the, with the armed force or the armed group.